to the members of the church. So it's just a little bit easier to follow along. As well, you can go back, look over it yourself, kind of build your own convictions, and as well, remember what I said, because most of you will not. Um, but, yeah, so if not, and you guys are turning in your Bibles, um, we are mainly going to be stationed in Luke chapter 13. But the first verse we are going to run across is in Acts chapter 3. So you can either turn to Luke, 5, uh, Luke 13 or Acts chapter 3. You know, in life, um, it's kind of funny. There are just words that we are scared of. Oh, wow. We do not like hearing in our life. Right? Have you guys ever seen um, Lion King? Yeah. Whatever the hyenas, Mufasa. <laughs> right? that, that's kind of how we react in our own lives when we hear certain words. Oh, no. There are words that we are just straight up afraid of, that we avoid like as death at our doorstep. Oh. You know, we don't like words like taxes. Yeah. Oh, oh. Dishes. <laughs> Uh, laundry, Ooh, yeah. responsibilities, mm. and even for some men, if it's at the wrong, uh, wrong time and you weren't expecting it, anniversary. Oh, <laughs> okay. where did that come from? Right, because most of these words are somewhat blessings within themselves, but we distort them because how it affects us. Right? We love having clean dishes and clean clothes in the, in the kitchen, but we don't want to do it ourselves, so we avoid that word. <laughs> we love to have our, our roads paved and the lights working, but we don't want to be the ones that have to supply that and pay our taxes. Right. You know? And, and, and all these things is kind of the same thing. In the same way, the Bible is full of amazing words that people have cultured themselves to quarrel with. Okay. Most words that we really like, when Jesus started to preach them, we probably didn't, uh, people in the world didn't like them that much. Mm. Right? The word love. Wow, that's an amazing word. Jesus comes around and now says, love your enemy. Uh -oh. I don't love love anymore. <clears throat> Forgive. Wow, that's awesome. Yes, we have to be forgiving. Forgive everyone who sins against you. Oh. Ooh. Be rich. <laughs> that's awesome. Be rich towards God. Mm. Again, Jesus is changing these words in our yeah. lives. There's another word that he says that actually it's a good thing in our life, but don't know a lot of people have different feelings about it. Mm -hmm. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So that's Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Thanks, Sean. You know, our, our relationship with the word change is a very complicated one. Mm, come on. The word change, we don't know how we really feel about it sometimes. We love it when it's regarded to that one person that we know in our life, like, man, I want that person to change. Mm -hmm. We embrace it when we're looking for it. Um, we, we're inspired by it. We, we go into greater heights in our own lives because we're moved by it. But we also hate change in our life. Mm. It's this love-hate relationship with this word. Mm. Um, especially, express especially when um, we're not expecting it. Especially when we are changing in areas we don't want to change it. Mm. Have you ever wished that you can change one thing in your life that doesn't affect other things? Yeah. Man, I wish I can just change my job, but it doesn't affect other things in my life. Mm. Yeah, that, that, it doesn't work that way. And repentance is kind of the same thing as that word change. Come on. It's something actually to be cherished, to desire, to seek after in our life. Mm. But... We don't feel that way. I mean, we look into this scripture and who wouldn't want all their sins to be wiped away? Right. Who wouldn't want times of refreshing in their life? That sounds awesome. Mm. But yet, sadly, for many people, repentance is a word that we rebel against. Mm. We fear. We hate. We avoid. It is so sad that the solution to many people's problems has become now a dirty word. Come on. That people use as excuses, <laughs> even in the religious world, it, it, repent? No, that's works. Mm. They, even, they even try and make it like it's something bad that we shouldn't be talking about. Mm. And so, in this time, if you want to now turn in your Bibles to Luke 13, um, we're going to see Jesus take this word and make it now personal. Come on, John. Don't just like that word for other people or other situations, but what about you? Yeah. Come on, John. So my title of my lesson tonight is simply, What About You? Come on, Sean. We're going to look at Jesus and his story and how he's going to take repentance and actually fruit and now make it personal. Mm. So my point number one is repentance is personal. Mm. Come on. Point number one, repentance is personal. We're going to start here in Luke chapter 13, verse 1 through 5. Come on. 
It says, now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. We'll understand that a little bit more later on. Jesus answered, do you think that those Galileans are worse sinners than all the other Galileans who have suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Are those 18 who died when the tower in Salem fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. So we see here, obviously, there's some context that we need to understand. Yeah. Right? There's some conversation going on here, and Jesus is digging into what they're talking about here. So some people had brought up this tragic event and incident to Jesus, and now Jesus was using this topic to kind of teach them a lesson. Mm. Um, so the first thing is that they were talking about these Galileans, and they also mentioned Pilate here, right, in verse yeah. 1. And what was going on is that Pilate during this time... Um, Pilate, if you don't know who Pilate is, he was the governor in Jerusalem, or kind of around there. And he had this idea, and he actually he's well known, one of the greatest uh, uh, achievements he did was his kind of plumbing system, his aqueducts that he started to bring into the places that he ruled. And what he wanted to do in Jerusalem is that in Jerusalem they had horrible sewage, they had horrible plumbing there. And what he wanted to do was bring a kind of revamp plumbing system there, but he wanted to use the money in the temple to do that. And so it was kind of like mixing uh, the government and the Galileans there. And he wanted to do that. And so the Jewish population was totally against this notion. And so they wanted to kind of make this peaceful protest to them, uh, to Pilate and them using that money for the government. They didn't want God's like, uh, uh, God's like, um, excuse me, God's money in his temple to now be used like government taxes. Mm. And so they actually organized this pre peaceful protest. They did not want to be violent. But Pilate, it says that he um, secretly put like some of his military in the protest as well to stir up violence. Mm. And so this is kind of what he's talking about here. And because of this event, it's actually said in, in history, that's why Pilate and Herod may have become enemies because of this event. Mm. If you read throughout the Bible, it says that they were against each other. It's because that Pilate started to stir up things in Jerusalem that shouldn't have been stirred up. Come on. So he brings this out first. He says, okay, hey, do you think that they're any worse than, than you guys living today? Then he goes on and starts talking about this tower in, in Salem that fell on the 18 workers that were working there. And what is suggested is that these 18 workers that, that was mentioned in the scriptures were actually 18 workers that were working on the aqueducts, meaning the, the, the sewage system that Pilate wanted to implement. And so what they saw as is, well, hey, these workers started to take money from the temple. So God made that tower fell on them because of their unrighteousness. Mm. And so Jesus is pulling this in here. He's saying, hey, do you think you guys are, are better than these people that the tower fell on? No, they're not any worse or any better. No, no, that, that you have to repent as well. Come and what on. he was saying is he was really going against the Jewish culture. Mm. See, what was happening here in the Jewish culture is that they had this kind of understanding of that. They had this, this feeling that suffering was always accompanied by sin. Mm. That they firmly associated those two things. Yeah. You know, do, do you even remember even how Jesus' disciples in uh, John chapter 9, verse 2, when they saw a blind man, they right. asked Jesus, hey, who sinned? Was it him or his parents? Right. They saw some type of suffering or some type of setback, and they always associated that to sin. And God was like, no, nobody, Jesus said, nobody sinned. This is just for God's glory. Yeah. And in the same way, that's kind of what they looked like at, at this tower as well. They said, well, the tower fell on them because of their unrighteousness. Jesus, Jesus was like, no, had nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. But I promise you, if you don't repent, you will perish. Wow. And so he's making it personal to them again. Yeah. And that notion about, hey, suffering always is, a, a, is accompanied with sin, it, it was a really bad culture that they had there. You can even go all the way back to Job. Remember when Job, if you ever read that story, a lot of bad things started happening in his life? Right. And one of his friends actually came up to him. He said, who, uh, excuse me, it's in Job 4, verse 7. It says, who that was innocent ever perished. So even in there, all the way back to Job, which is actually one of the first books ever written, 
was going back like, hey, suffering always is accompanied by sin, or sin is always accompanied by, by suffering. And so Jesus is saying here, no, it's not about that. But he's making now it personal to them. He's saying, hey, you guys personally, though, need to repent. Or you're going to face perishing in your life. Wow. He was saying this in two different ways. It was them, one, individually, but two, as the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. Jesus was predicting and foretold the destruction of Jerusalem. That was going to be later on in 70 AD. And he was saying that, hey, if you guys continue in your rebellion, in your plotting, in your personal, uh, uh, um, in, in, your, in your political um, ambitions... And you are pretty much committing national suicide between you and God. Because he knew that later on, Rome was going to step in and they actually did destroy Jerusalem. So what he brings this all back down to, is he's saying all these things for them personally, but he brings it back down to them individually. Say, so if you guys do not repent, you too will perish. We even read here in Acts chapter 26, verse, 20, um, verse 21, 20 to 21, it says... Here in Acts chapter 26, verse 20 to 21, it says, First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. Mm -hmm. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. So that was Acts chapter 26, verse 21, uh, 20 to 21. Come on, Sean. It was saying here, that why did a lot of the Christians back in the day get persecuted? Because they were preaching that same word Jesus was preaching. Mm. And that word that people wanted to avoid in their life. You too need to repent. See, we are called to repent and prove it by our deeds. Yeah. Though we may not see immediately suffering in one way or another if we don't repent, we are one day going to have to face God. Come on, yeah. Sean. And this is what he said, you guys need to repent. And people did not like that word. People did not like to hear it. Repentance, and as well, the other words, prove it. Mm. By your deeds, let me see something different in your life. Mm -hmm. See, people on earth hate to hear that word repent. Yeah. But those in hell wish they can hear it one more time. Wow. Come on, Sean. They wish that they can get you one more time where somebody can preach to them, hey, change your life. See, what must we focus on then? The first thing we have to ask ourselves, have we repented? Yeah. Have we changed things in our life? Have you turned away from your sin and proved it by your deeds? Come on, Sean. See, repentance doesn't mean that you're just sorry about what you're doing. Repentance is when you're sorry enough to change. Mm. See, 2 Corinthians 7, 9, it says, Yet now I am happy. So, sorry, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Uh, you can catch up with me there. It says, Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, because your sorrow led you to repentance. Mm. See, hell is full of sorry people. Heaven is full of changed people. Wow. Yeah. Come on, Sean. And that's the difference. See, I really want to encourage you guys to look back into your own life and adopt that word repentance in your life. See, when I was studying the Bible, I remember um, when I first became a Christian, and this was actually about maybe the first or second year I became a Christian, um, me and actually my leader, we were studying the Bible with this guy named, I think his name was Jason, and um, actually it was Nick, it was Nick, and we were studying the Bible with him, and um, he, his biggest thing that he had to repent of is he had this strong addiction to drugs, mm. uh, to heroin specifically, and he actually started to repent of it. He started to change his life. He moved out of where he was living, kind of like in a motel, moved in with Christians, uh, deleted all his contacts before, and he was really changing his life. But one day before the day he was supposed to get baptized, he decided, hey, I just want to do it one last time, one last goodbye. And if you've ever done hard drugs in your life, um, your tolerance when you do it kind of goes higher, 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 but when you stop, it goes back down. And so when you do the same amount, your body can't really handle it. Mm. And Nick, that night, he OD'd. Mm. He died. Aww. And it was something, we were all shocked when we came to church that morning. 
Because we first got there and we're expecting, where is he? He's late. What's going on? Mm. And everybody, and then, and then his father was coming to church as well. And he went over to his house and found him dead. Oh and it was just one of those things. Is like, man, he, he didn't get that extra chance. Mm. One little step back, it, it changed mm. his life, his yeah. destiny and where he lived. So my first challenge to all of us guys is to understand that repentance is a good word in our life. Yeah, come on, John. Then when you're studying the Bible and someone's calling to you to repent or you start to hear it in, in your own life, adopt that word. Come on, bro. Because sin is the cheapest thing on the market that we pay the highest price for. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's the cheapest thing, yet we pay so much for it. It's mm -hmm. never worth it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, the sun may rise tomorrow, but you may not. And that's where Jesus, what about you and your repentance? Mm. Let's take repentance personally. Now we're going to continue on and Jesus teaching them here. My point number two is fruit is personal. Come on, Sean. Fruit is personal. Luke chapter 13, verse 6 through 9. says, Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I have been coming to you for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut it down. Mm -hmm. So we see here Jesus talking about this parable, about this tree that's not bearing fruit. And he's talking back and forth with the owner and he's the worker. And we're going to see what kind of that means. But I don't know about you. Have you ever been mad at an inanimate object? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever just like cursed like the, 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 the couch because you kicked your toe on it or anything, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of Jesus telling that in a parable, that this guy is just mad at this freak fig tree. Mm. And we're going to see kind of why, what's going on with this fig tree. What we see here, at least on um, kind of like a bird's eye view, is this parable is teaching that uselessness invites disaster in our lives. Wow. Right? That th Because it wasn't doing anything, this guy's looking at, we got to get rid of it. Wow. So what is he talking about here? What does this actually parable mean? The fig tree is symbolizing Israel, the nation of Israel, God's people. Wasting, well, it was wasting valuable soil in the vineyard and wasting resources to take care of it. God's been going over it over and over and over again, calling it to obey, calling it to repent. Is that you're just wasting my time almost. Wow. The expectation, what was the expectation for them? To bear spiritual fruit. We kind of understand what that means in our lives today. And the warning, at least here, was that if it continued to be unfruitful, it would be destroyed as well as replaced. Pretty hard parable here. Mm -hmm. So... Going through it is Jesus is the man taking care of the tree. God is the owner of the vineyard. And Jesus was kind of giving them, hey, God, please just give them one last chance to prove their repentance. And Israel, what was the way to prove repentance? By bearing spiritual fruit. Mm -hmm. So this parable kind of strictly targets those in the church. Mm. Where we're failing to bear fruit. Come on, it talks about this. It talks about that we're, 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 we're wasting up space. Wow. We're using up precious soil and resources in the church. Mm. Whether that's we're using mentorship, we're worshiping in vain, or we're, we're, we're t only taking love and not giving it. Mm. That's, that's different things that we can be wasting. But one thing that we have to always recognize is, well, how do we bear fruit then, right? That's the first thing we can kind of ask ourselves. Mm. If you're turning your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 15. Come on, Sean. That this parable is talking about bearing spiritual fruit and how important that is to God. And we're going to see why it, that's important. Because in John chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Mm. See, what I love about this scripture is that, yes, fruit is personal, but also it's connected with God. Yeah. That is not just something that you look at yourself and like, man, why am I not doing it? Look at yourself in the mirror. But it's just like, just stay connected to the vine. Mm. And it's so awesome that this teaches that God is so um, invested in you yeah. to bear fruit. So invested in you. 
Mm. He's saying even when you're fruitful, guess what he's going to do? He's going to still clip some things out of your life to even be more fruitful. It's like God yeah. is, is the one helping us to be fruitful. Come on, Sean. God is the one that's doing that as well. He provides people to prune you, to water you, to improve you, and give you the best chance to be fruitful. Mm. And what I love about this is, yes, it's personal, but as well, it's, it's personal for the church. Yeah. Right? We're one body. Yeah. We don't just kind of like, okay, the hand needs to do this, the foot needs to do this. No, we do it together. Come on, Sean. Do so you read here in 1 okay. Corinthians chapter 3, uh, 6 through 9, 1 Corinthians 3. It talks about here that they're working together to bear fruit. It says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, and God has been making it grow. So that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God right. who makes things grow. Mm. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. They have e and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. We are God's field and God's building. So cool. See, it's, it's pretty awesome here. We, we have all we have, right? All we have to do is our little bit. Mm. If you're the one to do the watering, you do the water. If you're the one to plant the seeds, that's awesome. Yo, know, and, and it's so easy. Kind of to understand, not really to do. <laughs> you know, right? We feel that. It's easy to understand that we just got to do our little bit, but it's sometimes hard to have that faith. Yeah. God, should I be doing more? God, why isn't it working? You know, you, you plant the seed, and the scary thing about when you plant the seed, it's underground, you have no idea if it's growing. Mm. That's the hardest bit of planting, right? You don't actually see the fruit right away. Mm. And that's the thing is that we have to do this and, and do it with all our heart. Though even though we may not be guaranteed things. Right? Doing your best doesn't always guarantee fruit. Doing it with the best intentions doesn't always guarantee fruit. Yeah. But yet, at least what we can read here in the scriptures, is that if you're connected to the vine, you'll bear fruit. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we're working together and we allow God to do his bit, we can now bear fruit. Come on, Sean. See, it's awesome that we just have to do this and follow the advice and, and stay connected to God. I know through many times the last week and a half, um, we came back, for those that are just visiting tonight, most of us in the church went out to a, a church conference uh, back in Sydney in our, in our sister church out there. And it was an awesome conference, which me personally, I kind of went, went uh, came back from it, which is like, I'm not going to be focused on like, fruit anymore, just baptisms and anything. I just want to focus on my relationship with God. Come on, Sean. But every single time I start to meet that awesome person or study the Bible with somebody, my heart just keeps getting tempted to that. I'm like, no, 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 get away from me. God, God, God. Mm -hmm. But yet I, I still want to enjoy the blessings of it and everything. Mm -hmm. But I think what I, what I really wanted to adopt in my life is that I've stopped looking at it and having faith in the seed. Mm -hmm. Let me just have faith in the, in the gardener. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I started to stop praying about God help, help, you know, Callan. I have faith in Callan or faith in this person, faith in that person. It's like, God, I have faith in you. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to do what needs to be done. Come on, Sean. See, with personal fruit, guys, I want to give you the challenge. You know, are you still giving your whole heart and do you believe you can be fruitful? Mm. Some of us may have stopped believing in that. Yeah. I haven't, though I'm focusing my whole relationship with God, I, I know God can work through me. Yeah. Right. But I just really want to encourage you guys. Have you given up that dream to be fruitful? Mm -hmm. For every person in the church, I want to give you one challenge. Be fruitful by, by, the, by the end of this year. Come on. Come on. That doesn't mean go out and just focus on the scripture. Uh, excuse me. Go focus on just evangelizing people. Kind of get your heart all mixed up and everybody. No. That means focus on the gardener. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what it means to be fruitful. Mm -hmm. Stay connected to the vine. Yeah. That's what it means to be fruitful. Come on, John. And as well as we just do our bit with each other. Yeah. We look at each other that it's not just one person in the church that needs to go and make a disciple, that every single person working together as we're working with God Come to on, go Sean. and make a disciple. Come on, Sean. So I just want to give everyone that challenge. Woo! Write that down. Every single person just bear one fruit by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. See, in summary, guys, the lesson about what about you, I think this is really cool because there are so many words that we can even be afraid of in the church. Mm. Repentance, fruit, baptism. What about you? But now we get to see scripturally, these are words that we need to adopt. Yeah. Yeah. These are words that we should not be running away from anymore, but have full faith in our relationship with God that He's going to help us repent. Mm. God grants repentance. Yeah. 
that God is the one that's the vine and bears the fruit in us. Mm -hmm. That it's not just us looking at, yes, it's about us, but as well, it's about God. Mm -hmm. So guys, I want you to now adopt in your heart, don't be scared of these words anymore, but be fired up when they come into your life. And that's the lesson. Woo! Come on, Sean! <laughs>